Thank you very much for bringing some light into the obscurity of this regulation and showing where the, where the shadows are. I just want to make two points. One point is uh, this reference to German law. I thought, oh, Avanti Germania. Uh, this is not correct, uh, exactly true because it is true that 60% of all applications to the European Patent Organization come from outside not only the European Union, but even from outside the EPO organization. However, many of these applicants do have, if not their residence, at least one business uh, location in the, in, within the Union. So probably the, you know, the part of Germany will be reduced from 50% to 20% or something, which is good enough. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, the second remark is, we are now having more positive, we are now going to have a break, but uh, the negative is, I want to invite you to keep it to 15 minutes, so that we are back here within 15 minutes instead of 20. Just to catch up. Thank you very much. We are going to continue trying to keep, you know, to keep some place for the lunch break, which is the most important thing after all. Uh, uh, much more nourishing than anything else. Um, we now have a presentation by Professor Manuel de Santos Real, uh, who is going to be squeezed in between uh, his position as a Spanish academic and as a former uh, vice president of the EPO. So he's going to take the role of Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in making the presentation. Go ahead, please. Thanks very much. Questo non è la guerra entre la Spagna e gli altri paesi dell'Unione Europea. Questa è un'altra cosa. Devo, devo dire buongiorno a tutti. La ringrazio e la ringrazio alla professoressa Onorati per l'invitazione. Sono molto contento di essere qui oggi. E penso che devo cambiare all'inglese perché sennò, eh, sennò farei una distruzione non solamente dell'italiano ma dell'italiano dell e anche dell'espagnolo. No? I woke up this morning at 5 o'clock, I have to say. And I found this. Please have a look. This is a letter which was sent today to the member states of the European Union for uh, sign, co-signed by some enterprises. Could you read them, please? Where? Yeah, read. Yeah. Adidas. Apple, Arm, Blackberry, Ball, Cisco, Deutsch, Deutsch Telecom, Google, Earth, Intel Corporation. The list is too long anyway. <laughs> Microsoft, all, all the big enterprises have signed this. So it changed completely my presentation because this is the beginning of the letter. And the beginning of the letter shows three things. First, we appreciate that Europe, so there is a problem with what Europe means. Second, has long worked. What does it mean, long worked? And uh, towards a unified patent system. What does it mean, a unified patent system, in this framework? <laughs> a, a European Union patent? You see, there is only one understanding, really, the future, all the others are looking for. Or a European patent? Is it the same, a European patent or a European Union patent? I have three theses, and this is the first one. I'm convinced we are moving from institutionalism to intergovernmentalism. So we are in the process, very fundamental process in history, of moving to a scenario where the leadership is not in the institutions of the European Union anymore, Perhaps they will come back in the future, but not anymore. They are back to the member states 
which assume the protagonism. This is my first thesis. Second thesis, as a consequence of that, is that we are in the process of moving from the setting up of an actual European Union patent system, finding its justification in the internal market and the economic union, to another concept which is completely different, the setting up of a European patent system which finds its justification in the cooperation between sovereign states. Complete different scenario. And third, as a result of that, we are moving from the European Union environment to the European Patent Organization environment, where the key player used to be the Commission, and now perhaps one of the key players could be the European Patent Office. This is what I got this morning, and this is what I would like to discuss with you in the next 17 minutes. What does it mean, the word Europe? Please have a look. What is Europe? What is Europe? We are talking about this. So 47 members of the Council of Europe, for instance. Is this Europe? Is this Europe? 40? So the member states of the European Patent Organization plus the extension states, is this Europe? 40? Is Europe 38? So the member states of the European Patent Organization. Is Europe the European Union? Or is Europe the 28 member states of the European Union? Is Europe 26? So the 26 member states of the European Union participating in the enhanced cooperation? Is Europe 26? So the 26 member states of the European Union having signed the Unified Patent Court Agreement? Is Europe 25? So the 25 members, what does it mean? Is Europe 13 to 25 member states participating in enhanced cooperation and having ratified the Unified Patent Court Agreement? What is Europe? This is my first question. If we, if we don't clarify this, then we go nowhere because the interests will be very different. What does it mean Europe has been long worked? What does it mean long work? I understand a patent system as a system having five elements. You need a patent office, you need a patent granting office. These two things could be subcontracted but you need them. You need a patent title. You need a patent law, in this case, European Union patent law. You need patent judiciary. This is a patent system. Let's see what happened. In 1962, we had the draft, which is published now after 50 years of, uh, <coughs> of confidentiality in the European Commission, which contains the five elements of the system. In 1973, we move into the European Patent Convention, which has two elements of the system, only two, the two first. Then we move to the Community Patent Convention, having three elements of the system. The Regulation 2000 and 2003 had the elements of the system three, four, five, not the one and the two. The opinion of the Court of Justice obliged us to start again. And then we have the Enhanced Corporation, which contains zero elements of the system, and the Unitary Patent Court, which contains one element of the system. This is the situation we have today. So, these are the elements of the system. How these elements of the system play? I think, and this is the core of my speech, it should, there should be two, two questions to discuss. The first of all, there is nothing to do with the European Union, sorry, the Union is missing there, with the European Union patent system. But could it be this, the arrival of a European patent system? There is nothing to do with the European Union patent system because if we see the five elements of the system, the first one, 
Do we have a patent office? We have a patent office. We have the EPO. It's true, it's subcontracted. But I think there's no point now to start with another community patent office. The EU, the, the EPO works quite well. Do we have a patent process, a patent granting process? We have it, it's subcontracted, but it could work. Okay, we have two elements of the system. Do we have a patent title? Certainly not. The European Union patent does not exist. The European patent with unitary effect is not a patent title. It's a European patent with a unitary effect. It's not a special agreement under Article 142. Read this, please. 142 gives no option. You go this way, you go this way. What we have done in the regulation is given the option. And the European patent needs to be validated in member states of the European Patent Organization to be effective. We don't have a patent title. Do we have a patent law? Certainly not. There is no European Union patent law applicable to the non nata European patent. There is no European patent law applicable to the European patent with unitary effect. And part of the uniform patent law is in the EPC, part of the uniform patent law is in the UPC agreement, but both are two international conventions. We don't have European Union patent law. Do we have the judiciary? No. The European Court of Justice is not competent. It has been put aside clearly. And the UPC is an international, national court, polyphacelic, competent for all European patents. So this is nothing to do with the European Union patent system, what we have in hands. Could it be the arrival of an actual European patent system? Well, we have the patent office, we have the patent process, is this true? Until now, could you agree with me, more or less, yeah? Do we have a patent title? No, my dears. Yeah. Validation is still needed today. Do we have a European Union patent law? Well, it's much closer than before, but it's still not. We have a patent judiciary. But the cornerstone of a patent system is the patent title. And the patent title in this so-called European patent system does not exist. So what is the new role for the EPO under this environment? This could be the question number four. Have a look to this Article 9.1. The participating member states, some states of the European Union, shall. It does not say the institutions of the European Union or the European Union shall. No, no. The, Euro the participating states shall give the EPO the following task. So, the EPO has understood immediately that this is an opportunity, opened doors and said, well, just give me tasks. But for instance, does it mean that the EPO will become not only a granting office, but a registering office? Does it mean that the administrative council of the EPO has to accept? The EPO organization is an international organization. Some member states cannot come and give some task to a to an office which is not more than one of the pieces of the European Patent Organization. How can some member state give this tax to the executive body? How is the budget of the EPO going to be financed this tax? There is no any fee for registration, for instance. There will be, certainly, but we don't have it for the time being. So it's not so easy to put this into practice in the sense that when bringing two international organizations, in this case, member states of the European Union, not even the European Union with the European Patent Organization, it was not thought how these relations should be put into place. These are my thesis then, and I will come right away to the conclusions, Professor Rul. I still believe these three pieces. And only if we understand these three pieces, we can understand how this process has come. First conclusion. We have to accept that in this game, political will pre
prevailed. Over rationality, I should say. Messages like, finish this bloody exercise which runs more than 50 years, please. This, was, this message was clearly sent to the Commission. And uh, Mr. Koenig has said this morning, and it's true that this is not a Ferrari, this is not a Ferrari. We see here later on that the Commission, I learned when working for the European Commission in the legal service, that when there is a will, there is a way. That's true, but not whatever way. Put the Court of Justice out of the game. All in all, what has happened with enhanced cooperation is not more than a battle between France and Spain. The very moment Spain put on the table a document saying English only, France understood that they, they could not cope with this. They had to start immediately something. And they have the Senate and they have the House behind them, selling them over our body. And if I could be French, I would have done exactly the same. So this is just a battle, an internal battle, which was solved with this enhanced cooperation, uh, which had been ambitious, certainly, for very different purposes, not for this one. So it is possible to make possible the impossible. My second conclusion is here, the economic aspects are completely presupposed. So does the proposed system really boost innovation and get savings? I have read, I have listened so many times, 80% of savings from 35,000 to 5,000. If I tell you how did we arrive to the figure of 35,000 and how this figure of 5,000 have come, uh, we don't know really how this is going to Effect. Amongst other things, because we don't know the renewal fees, and it's going to be quite a task to put the renewal fees on the table when the requisites are just impossible to fulfill, to fulfill if you put them one after the other. Who will benefit then the system? I'm not saying we don't need a system, we, de we need desperately a European Union patent system. What I'm not so sure is whether we really have studied the consequences from an economic perspective. This is political will. Economic aspects have been overshadowed. That's all. And the result is that there are too many legal risks. Uh, of course, I will not come to this risk, but you all know that there are a lot of legal risks, independently even of the judgment of the Court of Justice in the case of Spain. And now what to do? One minute more. Listen, I'm convinced, first of all, we do need to bring the vision back to the European Union. If not, we just miss the point completely. And the risk of crystallizing a system where the European Union institution will lose the control is too high for a guy who is 30 years fighting for the development of the European Union construction. We do need a European Union patent policy and we have to support these people in the Commission trying to put it on the table. And we have to do it bluntly and we academics we have the duty to say it again and again and again. We have to support these people because these people today, in an environment where the institutionalism goes down and the intergovernmentalism goes up, they feel very alone. Third, we do need to solve the language issue. Please don't tell me that this is not possible. This is not a question of surrenders. This is not a question of good or bad boys. This is a question of sitting down and trying to solve the problem. Because at the end, the problem was a problem between France and Spain. And I am convinced that if the European Commission comes thoroughly and gently again, the problem has to be solved. Because either Spain and Italy are within the system and the enhanced cooperation is put far away, mile, thousand miles, or just we will not fly with an actual European Union patent system ever. 
And finally, we need to clarify what is the role of the European Patent Organization and the EPO and all this game. Please don't forget, the European Patent Organization, in its former vice president speaking, was established always in 1973 because there was a need at this very moment of bringing the British and bringing the Swiss and because a patent office and a patent granting procedure was something harmless. It didn't affect the very core of the system, but it was never ambitious for flying completely alone the way it has flying very successfully, I have to say, today. Thank you very much.